thank you very much. Thanks so much. I, uh, my family just got a little bigger. <laughs> I'm, as you know, as um, Kathy said, I'm the bishop of the Diocese of Albany. I've been there since uh, April the 10th, uh, 2014, and we have about 300,000 good people, Catholic people there too, a uh, large diocese, almost the size of the state of Massachusetts. But um, now I have 7, 700,000 more folks, and I like to think of you all as family as well too. Uh, I feel a little bit like uh, the neighbor down the block, that, and I've realized that uh, this family has been suffering quite a bit uh, in recent months and years. And uh, my heart just goes out to you, and uh, what I see is a need for a tremendous amount of healing, uh, good conversation, honest conversation, openness. I just got back, as you know, from uh, what is known as an ad limina visit, in which uh, bishops from various regions of the United States visit with the Holy Father. And um, I think of our meeting with Pope Francis, you know, when the bishops from New York State were, were with him. And I remember one of the first things he said is he looked at each and every one of us and said that we're family. Uh, I would like to encourage frank conversation. Do not be afraid. Speak what's on your mind. Speak what's in your heart. And uh, he said something which I thought was very humble in his part. He said, you know, I don't understand everything about the United States, about what you're dealing with. I know that you, you suffer quite a bit. I know that you find it's been very, very difficult, you know, ministering as bishops, as fathers of families that are hurting. But I want you to be able to speak from your heart. And uh, that is this tone that I would like to establish right here, right now. And I want to also say I'm very thankful for all of the members of the press and the media that are here. I highly respect your position as professionals. And, uh, and uh, I thank you for the work that you have done. I think in many ways, we would not be where we are today, and we still have a lot of work to go, to do and to go forward. But uh, the revelations that have been so painful, that have been so difficult for us to face up to because they were so shocking, and I'm speaking not just of Albany, but the church in the United States, and ultimately around the world, would not have been possible uh, without the good work that you're doing. So I really welcome your collaboration, a spirit of openness and dialogue, and to know that I am available to you, and I hope that you also will feel very comfortable uh, in your conversations with me as well, too. And uh, that having been said, too, uh, and I'm glad that the department heads are here, you know, uh, the work of, uh, I'm appointed as what is called an apostolic administrator, and the work of any administrator, those of us that have read Peter Drucker, know that uh, any, any administrator is only as good as his advisors or her advisors, and that uh, it's so important to have good collaboration. And, uh, and I am encouraging that, you know, particularly cooperation among clergy and laity in the spirit of Vatican II. That's the way I like to manage, consultative management. But my primary role as I see it is more as a pastor or as a father, because I, I come as a healer. Now, I have no white papers, no hidden agenda. Uh, I didn't get a big document from the Holy See that said, this is what you have to do. I have no marching orders other than to show up and to be who I am. So if there are any questions about why me, why was I chosen, why, I have no idea, except that I'm here. I got the call from the Apostolic Nuncio, and I said to him, I'll give it my best shot. But my desire to be with you is uh, as any father, or maybe more of a grandfather, I suppose, of a family that I know is hurting and in need of healing. So uh, my first priorities will primarily be to listen. I want to hear what's in your heart and what your concerns are, uh, where you think we should go. I, uh, th this is only my first day here, so I don't come here with uh, a preconceived plan of what I'm going to do. I want to hear from you. And uh, whatever I do, I want to be something that will build up our, our friendship, build up our family. Um, we're all family. Uh, the survivors of sexual abuse are our family. Uh, I want everyone to be know, to know that they are, we were treated with respect. I continue as I do in the Diocese of Albany uh, to say, as I do in Albany, if you see something, say something. Never be afraid to come forward. You will be treated with respect. And that the, the processes, if, if, if there's need to, to change some of them, we will do that. Uh, if those that are working, we'll continue to follow them as well too. But they'll be done with openness, candor, and transparency. Uh, I can't help but think, you know, recently I attended a conference 
involving priests that were themselves the survivors of sexual abuse. And I remember saying at one point, you know, I can't think of speaking um, to a congregation every time I speak without thinking that maybe a good 20 or 25 percent of those folks that I'm preaching to have suffered in some way from abuse. Uh, maybe not a sexual abuse by clergy, which is so traumatic, but some form of maybe domestic violence or uh, some form of anybody that's grown up in a, in a home where there's alcohol or substance abuse knows what that's like, you know, the insecurity and all that, the boundaries that are crossed, how many people are suffering, and, and not to mention victims of human trafficking and other forms of violence, sexual and otherwise. And uh, one of the priests said to me, Father Ken from Kalamazoo, he said, you know, the figures show is actually as high as 50%. So we're all hurting in some way, and even if it's not personal, as members of families, as friends. So we have to develop a sense of openness and trust as family members do, um, and, and a, a great patience. And that's what I want to be able to do with you as we walk this walk. So that's my number one priority. Then again, uh, openness uh, of conversation, particularly with those that are suffering the most. Secondly, I think also uh, uh, my vision of a diocese uh, primarily is that the faith of the health of our diocese is in our parishes. Now this is not in any way to say that our support organizations, Catholic Charities, Catholic Education, all of the departments are absolutely key uh, to the running of the diocese. And we'll be sure that all of those diocesan services uh, are kept in a healthy state so that they can do the mission of the church throughout the diocese. But we here at the Catholic Center primarily are here to serve the parishes. And there is nobody that feels the brunt of all of the pain that we've been through all uh, through these years and these months more than our people in the parishes and our parish leaders. So I want to express my support to the priests and parish leaders, many of whom are lay people as well, collaborating together in every way that I possibly can to reach out to those in our parishes who are, who are hurting. I like to think of our parishes my favorite definition of parishes is, is that it's a family of families, and uh, a family for those without family or maybe without family. And um, that, uh, you know, they say that home is a place when you knock on the door, they have to take you in. I would like every parish to, to be an oasis of security where people can come home. And nobody feels left out, you know, not even the person in the back of the sea. I have a friend of mine who is a victim and survivor of sexual abuse and she has told the story many times because this occurred in a very young age. It was a priest friend of her family when she was very, very young at the age of six or seven. And uh, I remember her saying that, you know, when it became something that she became aware of because it's so traumatizing, that she said, I left the church 13 times. And, but I found myself, uh, even though I was so disillusioned and so hurt, uh, I kept coming back, you know, and sometimes I would just sneak into the church even when mass wasn't going on, and, uh, and I would come and I'd go. Finally, I got to the point after 13 times, I said, I'm not going to let any human being or any institution keep me away from Jesus, and I know that Jesus is here. So she returned to the church. She's a full practicing Catholic. She's telling her story, and maybe you'll get a chance to hear from her sometime, too. She's a close friend. And I think there are many folks like that too, you know, are looking for to find a path back. But there may be some obstacle there, maybe somebody they met. Um, how many times we've heard stories as Catholics, you know, I, I go way back to the 50s, I was born in 48, you know, where you hear somebody that had a terrible experience in a confessional, you did what? You know, or somebody that felt unwelcome and uh, never got, got over that, you know. And so we need to open doors up and open hearts up and, uh, you know, a lot of times people say, you know, how are you going to restore the trust? And, um, and there's no question that trust has been broken or compromised. And uh, I have to be, con be honest, I feel a little uncomfortable with that. And, and I'm going to be frank because, you know, that's my background. I come from Brooklyn. I'm a straight shooter. I speak at love what's in my heart. But sometimes I feel like, uh, you know, a husband uh, has been unfaithful to his wife and says, well, how many bunches of flowers do I have to send you till you finally take me back and, and trust me again? Uh, it goes much deeper than just performing acts, ritual acts. Uh, uh, trust is something that just has to be built, and ultimately it's a gift. 
So I would say to any one of you who may not trust me or trust people in my position as a, as a priest or as a bishop or clergy, first of all, don't judge us all as a class. I, I think we, we've done an awful lot of that, you know, all victims, all survivors, all priests, all bishops, all journalists, all lay people, all clerics, all men, all women. There's a lot of that going on. We have to avoid, at least I will try to avoid, uh, writing off people. I like to see every person as a child of God that has a story, that God loves deeply. And I think we need to treat one another with that respect. So I think that is the kind of atmosphere that can create a rebuilding of trust. If we see one another as children of God, all parts of God's family, that our stories, our experiences, some of them quite negative and very painful, are all valuable. And, and if they speak great pain and great hurt and, and even great anger, anger is not a step that we can bypass or sugarcoat. There's a place for anger, particularly if it can be turned into a passion for reform and for good. We have to listen. We have to be patient. This is what we do. We stick together as family. So that's the major message I want to convey. A victims first, survivors first, anybody who's suffering. Open door, dialogue, conversation. Uh, particularly respect for those that are, are in the trenches, parish leaders. Our role as diocesan administrators is primarily as parish support. We're there to help them, to make sure that uh, the people in our parishes, our parish families, are given the spiritual, moral, emotional, professional support that they need to do the good works of mercy. And uh, I will also say to those, too, that may have been so alienated from the church that uh, they may have been uh, withholding, you know. Uh, the, uh, the work that we do, the good work that we do, is not only to help Catholic people. The works of mercy, for example, that Catholic Charities performs. We're here for the entire community. Anybody that's hurting the suffering, the poor, that's part of our mission. Even the mission of Catholic schools really was primarily to bring education to poor immigrants. You know, people that did, did not have an opportunity to get in uh, to the American way of life, uh, to give them an education, to give them the tools and the skills to be able to integrate into American society. And we continue to see ourselves as serving the entire community. Um, money is going to be an issue that's going to come up, financial transparency, the specter of bankruptcy, those things. We'll examine all, all responsible options. Uh, but uh, the important thing, I fully believe that people are very generous of heart. They just want to be sure that whatever money, it, it goes to the right place. You know, so we want to make sure that all of our ways of accounting, you know, are transparent, are responsible, are accountable. And uh, I have no doubt in my mind that people will rise to the occasion to support the good works of mercy that benefit not only our church, but our entire community. So. Um, I don't know how much more time I have, but I'm, I, I, those are basically the things that are on my mind right now, and I would open up uh, uh, to any questions that any of you may have. To start with, I'm going to call on each of you, and we will have, I think, time for more than one question, but uh, let's get started, if we could, with Michael Mosiak uh, from WBFO Radio. I'll let him get his drink first. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you know, I just uh, had a little a flu-y type of thing about two weeks ago. It wasn't the flu, so I'm not uh, toxic, but I'm still getting a little over. It's got a little dry mouth. Bishop, uh, first of all, welcome to Buffalo. Thank you. Uh, as part of your role now as an apostolic administrator, what are the statuses of some of the auxiliary bishops um, who worked beneath your predecessor? Where do they stand right now? The uh, Good question. Bishop, there's no change. There's an old principle in canon law. You can read it in the code. Sede vacante, nihil innovator, that's Latin for your scholars there. It means, it, it, what this is called is sede vacante. In other words, the Episcopal seat of the bishop of the diocese is absent. So Bishop Malone is no longer bishop of the diocese. I am not the new bishop of the diocese. I will not be the new bishop of the diocese unless the Holy Father tells me something different, but he didn't tell me that. So I am the bishop of Albany. Uh, nothing changes, basically. Now, when I say nothing changes, that doesn't mean that I do not have the authority to make changes that absolutely must be made immediately. The changing of an auxiliary bishop is not a first priority. Bishop uh, uh, Ed has told me that he's willing to continue to serve, 
and uh, so as long as he's con willing to continue to serve, you know, that he, he, he would. Uh, and his status does not change because of the change uh, in uh, uh, the administrator of the diocese. How much of a say do you have in finding the permanent replacement? That's a very good question. Bishops, this is all, you can see this on the USCCB website. Bishops of a region, and this is the region of New York State, which we have eight dioceses, I believe it is, meet and periodically, I think it's every three years, do submit names to the Holy See at the Holy See's request of bishops, uh, candidates, potential bishop candidates. So uh, it, I would be one of the bishops that would be able to propose names of potential candidates to be ordained to the episcopacy. And I can, you know, I don't want to go into a lecture right here, but you'll see specifically bishops will be asked, who would you think would be a good auxiliary bishop? Who do you think would be a good bishop of a diocese? You know, uh, so it does get into great detail. Now, this is coordinated through the, uh, the office of the nuncio in Washington, D.C., who is the Pope's official, Holy See's official representative in the States. I am sure that others are consulted as well, too, but I would be one of those that are consulted. But I'd be one of several. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Tim Wenger, uh, let's do WBEM, please. I've heard of Brandon Keeney over here. Okay, Brandon. <laughs> okay. Um, what message do you have for people of this diocese who have been struggling for a long time now? What's your message to them and uh, saying basically that this will change? I am here for you. I am here to listen to you. I'm here to walk with you, and I'm here to help you heal. Uh, and uh, I would prefer to uh, convey that message by what I do and not just by what I say. And I will give you my all and my heart to yours. And uh, I would like to say maybe another thing too which comes from the heart of our faith that Jesus told us frequently, fear is useless, it's faith that counts. I believe that uh, for my personal relationship with Jesus Christ, that he loves me and that he loves every every person and i like to say this to every person this is from my faith of course and if you're not of the christian faith that god loves you we have a loving god and that uh, uh, and uh, and i realize that god loves me in spite of my sins and my failings and weaknesses and inadequacies and i want every person to know that i think that 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 is the same god that we all have that we can all go and when we all trust that we're not alone, that there is a God that loves us and is with us. It gives us a great deal of courage and openness to be able to talk with one another and to share our pain and not to be afraid. You know, so I would like to say, do not be afraid. Let's walk together. Uh, it's the message of our faith. I know this is from the heart of Pope Francis because that's the way he spoke with the bishops. And I'm grateful to him for appointing me. And I want to, uh, to, to uh, be a spiritual father uh, in, in that same spirit you know, with all that I have. Were you given any sort of indication on how long you'd be looking for? Absolutely this? not. I have no, none of the backstory. I don't know any of the machinations that went into my appointment, you know, who ultimately did it. I know ultimately it was Pope Francis that decided it would be me. And uh, I was, there's no white paper. I have no agenda in that sense. You know, I'm not the grand inquisitor. You know, I'm not here as a knight in shining armor. I'm not here, you know, as the fix-it man. I'm just here to be as a spiritual father and also obviously as an administrator to make sure that the <coughs> diocese uh, continues to operate in a way that is uh, accountable, responsible, transparent, and, uh, and uh, uh, in a way that effectively serves the mission of the diocese. So that's, that's the long and the short of it. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you Jay Tokas, Buffalo News, please. Sure. Hey, how are we? Hi, <laughs> Buffalo News. Yeah. Um, so, um, aside from the man at the top, very little, if nothing, has changed in this diocese at this point. There's still a lot. Of well, it's my first day, you know. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of turmoil yeah. here. Yeah. You know, 200 lawsuits under the CBA. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the specter of bankruptcy. Um, what? What can we expect going forward in terms of you are addressing those things? You could expect that that will be addressed. And uh, I suppose in some ways, uh, you know, a bankruptcy is a specter. 
you know, and I know there's a lot of concerns about the effects this would have on the lawsuits, you know, the ability of victims to pursue justice, which I'm very sensitive to. There, you know, people who are using, making use of the CVA. But I also will hear from professionals who understand the process and whether or not it is appropriate, which may well be. Uh, that'll be a decision that will be made as quickly as possible with consultation. And, uh, and I will listen to those that have experience in uh, how the, what these options are. Uh, and obviously, the, the possibility of, of Chapter 11. Uh, you know, remember the prime concern that we have is that the good works that we do can continue and not be impeded. And then also that all of those who uh, have legitimate uh, claims and, and need to be helped and given assistance are not deprived of that as well, too. There's a limited amount of assets and resources to go around. And uh, the challenge is to make sure that they get properly and fairly distributed. So that would be another factor involved in, in the consideration. A lot of times, as you know, in legislation, you have the possibility that, you know, one particular case may eat up all of the assets and then deprive others of the possibility uh, of, of receiving some sort of assistance that they may need. So all of these things will be taken under consideration. And as I say, whatever I do will be done with full professional consultation and the decision will be made quickly. You have the, the authority to Yes, do that, absolutely. I have all of the authority of a diocesan bishop unless anything was withheld and nothing has been withheld. And one, one follow-up, um, there's been much talk about uh, the report by I'm assuming that would be instructive for you. Uh, have you read the report? I have not, but I have been, uh, and I, first I'll tell you why. It is a report that was generated uh, under a sovereign state, Vatican City State, the Holy See. So it's a property of another, uh, tech, legally speaking, entity. So it is not the property of Bishop DiMarzio or the Diocese of Brooklyn or the Diocese of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Buffalo. And I have no idea who has had access to the report or not. I have had conversations with Bishop DiMarzio, who was a you know a colleague of mine. I come from the Diocese of Brooklyn. So I have some idea uh, of some of the uh, major factors that were identified, and they're very much along the line that I have just spoken to you as well, too, about the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the lack of, um, uh, of, of ability, I suppose, uh, to continue the governance of the diocese uh, that Bishop Malone has faced about the uh, uh, disaffection among clergy and some members of the diocese, uh, about the need for healing. That was the prime thing that I'm aware of, a need for healing and to have somebody be able to come in and help to heal the pain. And uh, uh, But uh, I do not know the particulars. But In, yeah. in the interest of transparency, would you push? I don't push. I, I I don't push the Vatican. I tell the I no. I don't do that. I'm not. I'm not political, uh, and I I do not manipulate. I do not use that type of approach. I will make it very clear that whatever information you know you can share with me, I would appreciate it. I will ask. Fair enough. Yeah. Okay, Charlie. How you doing? Thank you. You mentioned Auxiliary Bishop Burroughs is going to stay on here and, and play a, a role as your Auxiliary Bishop. I think a lot of Catholics have been reaching out to us and, and saying that they're surprised uh, at that because some of the um, file cabinets in this very building have shown that over the last 40 years, the Auxiliary Bishop's handwriting is literally on many of these uh, cover-ups that have gone on here. How can people have uh, faith and trust that the diocese under your administration is charting a new course when you have uh, part of the old guard still in place. That's a very good question, but you're giving me information now that I'm hearing now today. So uh, I did not know that uh, what you just told me is the cat facts. I've read a lot of different things. And if that can be established and if that proves to be something that would make it difficult for uh, Bishop Gross or any other priest of the diocese to perform their role, uh, then that would have to be something I take into consideration, and uh, it might might alter the status, the status quo. Do you think that there needs to be sort of a clean sweep or a, a clean slate, a cleaning out of, of you know, some of the advisors who advise the human roles? Well, I understand there has been quite a bit of attrition in recent months, and that many of the folks uh, that are now 
uh, are new. And uh, I don't know how much of that has been done already. I don't know how much of that remains to be done. Um, you know, uh, one of the things I have to do before making any sweeps is first to find out whether or not, in fact, there's cause to do that. In other words, are we, are we talking about evidence that there has been clear mismanagement and there has not been accountability? And naturally, that's one of the things I want to do uh, before automatically, you know, just sweeping people out. As I say, treating a person as a whole class of people, tainted in some way like that, that is an approach some people take. I don't know that that's fair. I like to see people as individuals and, and, and hold them personally to accountability, and we will. And where that needs to be done, it will be done. Uh, the second part of your question is, of course, if you, so clean sweep uh, would be too broad a stroke, I think, unless you have evidence that that is absolutely necessary. And uh, uh, then the next question is then who follows along the line there too. So I would have to be uh, aware of uh, what resource, and I'm sure we have plenty of resources <coughs> around too to be able to replace. So one of the, in that regard, one of the few constants here over the last 30, 40 years has been the role of uh, Terry Connors staff and attorneys here uh, in, in all of this, and many of these cases have been concealed from the public. We uh, advised Mr. Connors uh, a few weeks ago that we have learned that involvement of his law firm uh, is now the focus of a federal investigation, uh, although he's not supported that publicly in the um, Given that, uh, do you think that we would be open to considering uh, keeping that law firm on here as a law firm for the Yeah, obviously I would be open to anything. There's no uh, vested position of anybody who is an agent or an employee or uh, professional or otherwise of the diocese. But of course, a charge alone is not a conclusion, and we would have to see where that plays out. Uh, I certainly am concerned about uh, uh, the, um, any, any sort of a conflict of interest situation. So uh, if, if I see that there is evidence of that too, obviously is something I would have to act on. Steve? Hi, Steve. Um, we see in Bishop Malone's statement that um, he intends to continue to live amongst uh, what we are Catholics as Bishop Emeritus. I think for a lot of Catholics, that's going to be concerning because he is, like it or not, the symbol of the crisis that the diocese now faces. Can you please define what role he's going to have and how active that might be? The uh, Bishop, uh, the Bishop Emeritus, or the former Bishop of a diocese, becomes a member basically of the clergy of that diocese, and a Bishop Emeritus uh, or any other bishop would serve uh, at the pleasure of the uh, Bishop of the diocese, or in my case, the Apostolic Administrator. So it's a decision that I would have to make in, in, in consultations to whether or not it's appropriate or to what extent it would be appropriate for uh, Bishop uh, Malone to remain in the diocese, to serve in the diocese, under what capacity. Um, that was his statement, and uh, naturally I'll be in conversation with him, as well as with the Holy See, as to see what role, if any, would be appropriate for him in the diocese, and if not, where else. Uh, ultimately, where a bishop serves uh, is up under the jurisdiction of the Holy See, but uh, it would be within the uh, scope of my office to limit uh, greatly, entirely, or not, uh, the role that a retired bishop uh, would have. Uh, in terms of living, actually living, uh, living and living among are two different expressions, you know, physically living and living among, what does that mean? And I do understand exactly what you're asking, and I have no way of knowing what that percentage is. I've seen percentages, you know, before that, uh, that were put in some newspapers about how many people thought the bishop should or should not resign. I don't know whether any conclus anything conclusory can be drawn, you know, from that. But I will do the best I can to listen and at a good sense. Ultimately, all that we do, uh, whether it's Bishop Malone or even my own presence, the thing that has to ultimately be served is the good of the people of the diocese. And that's an assessment I'll have to make, and I will make it very seriously. Do you now think it's possible, in advance of making that decision, do you now think it's possible that he could serve in a role as a healer within this diocese? That's a really tough question, you know. Um, I, I think Bishop, uh, he made a prudent decision to withdraw as he did at the time that he did. 
And I don't know that his being present is the same thing as being present as a healer. You know, I mean, bishops can do certain things because they're priests, such as say mass, and uh, that uh, uh, can be a great service to people just to be able to have somebody preach in homilies. Whether he would be appropriate in a position as a healer is another question. And uh, given the fact that he has himself recognized that that was not something that he thought he could do effectively, I would support that decision. One last question. In regards to well, absolutely, to the best of my physical ability, and thank God for electronic media. My commitment is to be physically present at least one day a week, you know, uh, throughout the foreseeable future. I have it in my calendar through May 11, simply because that's when my confirmation schedule gets crazy. But uh, I have that planned. Uh, I will be here for longer periods of time as they are available. Uh, we're fortunate to have good uh, connectivity, live streaming. So, uh, for example, I have uh, planning to be in, in, in a kind of a teleconference with priests of the diocese this afternoon. Uh, that's something that can be done even remotely because of our communications capacities between Albany. So there'll be ways in which I can be uh, present in a personal way. Uh, I love going, you know, when I got the appointment of Bishop of Albany, when Cardinal, when Bishop Vigano called me up, the first thing that happened to me is, oh my God, if I'm going to be a bishop, I'll never be able to be a parish priest again. Because that was really primarily what I was, a pastor. And uh, my, my, in my heart is a desire to be a parish priest. So anything I could do to get out to the parishes, uh, and uh, we'll see what's, whatever is possible I'll do. I believe so. You know, I'm not. I'm not in, involved in working that out, but I'm going to be speaking with. When them. you speak to them, yeah. What's your message to them? Oh, first of all, I'm your brother. I'm here to walk with you. I want to hear your pain. I want to hear how I can help you, and uh, I just want to hear from them the struggles that they're experiencing, and the ways in which I could be a pastoral support to them and to their people. Bishop, next we have Chris Covadis from Channel 4 WIBC. Chris, hi, Chris. Good morning. I'm curious what Richard Malone has said to you about the situation in this diocese, if any. Have you had any discussions? No, with I have not had any discussion of any length with, uh, with Bishop Malone. Do you think you have a full grasp of the estrangement, I think, a lot of Catholics here, 600,000 Catholics? I don't see how I possibly could on my first day. Uh, I could tell you that I have I don't want to credit myself with a high degree of emotional intelligence, but I do have a way of feeling what's in people's hearts, and I do feel very intense pain and alienation. Uh, but it's much of it is anecdotal, and from what I've read, you know, in media accounts. And uh, I think the best way for me to get a sense is by conversation, by hearing from people personally, by them telling me their stories and uh, what they personally experienced. And uh, I think the more I can do that, the more I will understand that, too. Uh, Does any of that overwhelm you? It's, it's, you know, no, you know what? It's not about me. This is about the mission of the church. We are a family. Uh, I have a position in this family, as any father of a family has, to take care of my spiritual children. And uh, I can't do that alone. And that's why I need to work with pastors and with parish leaders and with lay people that helped me to do this too, that we work together as a team. And uh, that's what I want to build up, that sense of what we help one another. I, I often say this because I, I, I found it personally true in my life, that in my own experience, that it's often been what, is, what has buoyed me up is personal relationships in which people that I can speak to as friends, very honestly, very openly, have given me an incredible amount of courage that I know does not come from me, it comes from God through them. So I have great confidence that when we walk together in faith, it's the Emmaus experience, you read about in scriptures where Jesus just shows up, sometimes even when people are arguing, as long as they're doing it honestly and openly, that somehow or other there's a power of God that comes and buoys us up because we have a savior, it's not about us. And I think it's that kind of thing that unleashes this. Uh, I remember when I was in school that, you know, uh, 
one of the nuns told us, she's probably a saint now, that, you know, um, if you just help one other soul find the Lord, your mission in life will have been complete, you know? And uh, I think it's another way of saying that you or I may be the only Jesus some other person may know. So I have great confidence in this walk of faith. This is what Pope Francis calls the accompaniment. So I don't worry about it all depending upon me because you know, I'm, I'm just one person. I can only do what I can do. I try to set a tone. I try to set an atmosphere. I try to, you know, open my heart, encourage others to do the same as well too. But ultimately my confidence is in the Lord. My favorite prayer is, Lord Jesus, I trust in you. If I wake up screaming in the night at three o'clock in the morning, worried about what I'm gonna do, I just say, Lord Jesus, I trust in you. And that's my faith. That's what, that's what impels me. And that's why I don't panic. You know, Jesus says fear is useless. It's faith that counts. Can you tell me if uh, tomorrow somebody calls this building with an allegation against a priest, how will you handle that? Immediately. Immediately. I would first of all say tell the police right away. And then it will follow the normal procedures that we do. Uh, you know, what we've done in, in uh, Albany and what I would, would do here as well, too, is that if an allegation comes in, shows on its face it's some credibility. And by that I mean it doesn't have to go through legal counsel. Somebody says I was abused. If it's contemporaneous, obviously you have to address it immediately. And the appropriate thing that's usually done in a case when an allegation like that comes in is that you uh, inform the priest and then you uh, put him on administrative leave. So you put him out of active ministry until it can be investigated and you know the, it can be substantiated and then you take appropriate steps after that. So you follow that process. But again, I, I would say to anybody if you uh, have any uh, allegation to report, you know, go directly to the legal authorities. We also do have uh, toll-free numbers that are published on the, the website, both for ethics issues as well as abuse issues, contemporaneous or otherwise. So I always say, if you see something, say something. You. You're welcome. Cameron Hurst is from Tap Integrator Omea. Where's Cameron? Oh, how are you doing? Um, your background, uh, from what I've read, is don't hold that against me, no. all right? <laughs> yeah. Um, how do you feel as though that background, do you feel as though it uniquely qualifies you for the situation? I am not the judge of my qualifications here. The Holy See, the Pope decided to appoint me. I accept his judgment. He knows my biography and background. He's heard from others that he's consulted with. I trust that decision. Uh, a strength of the diocese as well is the presence of Catholic higher education, uh, several of which who have had leaders that have called on Right. Do you plan on touching faith? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to conversations with the good folks in the academic community. I'm Jesuit educated myself, too, you know, too, but I know Canisius College and Bonaventure. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Bishop, next we have Megan uh, Hall from the Olean Tongue Hi, Megan. Uh, so the movement is to restore trust in Buffalo Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last part. How do you plan to work with the movement to restore trust? And have I plan to work with them. <laughs> That's it. And as best way as we can collaborate together with their skills and mine and anything I can bring to the table, of course I do. And I'm thankful for their initiative. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. And earlier saying that you don't consider yourself a fix-it man. A what man? You said I don't consider myself a fix-it man. A fix-it man. Yeah. Yeah, because everybody wants something to be fixed, and I'm not sure, you know, I have to, uh, I'll do what I can, you know, if, if there's any fires burning, I'll try to put them out, I'll, you know, uh, if anything that needs immediate attention, but, you know, I, I also think that that's not my, what I meant to say is I'm not the only one here to do that, that's not my point, you go in and you fix everything, you know, I want to get the fixing in motion, but I want to do it with you. Absolutely. There's always room for hope, and there's always, as long as we have a life breath in us, not easy, not easy. Scars are going to remain. Memories are there. And anybody that's been a victim of abuse, that triggering moment can always happen and never goes away. You know, we have to walk with that pain a lot. You know, I mean, when Jesus, when he rose, he still had the nail prints in his hands. You know, so the memories uh, uh, are always going to be painful, but we're in it together you know we're not we're not alone 
Jesus told us, I will not leave you orphans, you know. So we're going to get through this. It's what families do. So uh, uh, I, I do not want in any way be Pollyanna or sugar coating or, you know. And, uh, I always say, too, you know, I'm not, we can't be afraid of reality. We have to be able to, with sober eyes, look at the damage that was done to see where it is. And the extent that we can heal, can't cover over to heal, to, you know, to knit some things together. It's like if you get a scar, you know, you have to go through the suturing and the healing and it takes time and the scar may always be there, but ultimately the wound, at least, uh, the bleeding stops. So it's, I use a medical analogy, but there may be others, yeah. Thank you so much, Megan. Who? Okay, Mark Hi, Mark. Uh, I guess at this point, I'll just maybe follow up on a couple of things that has already been brought up. You talked about financial transparency and the, the bankruptcy issue. Um, with uh, the resignation of Bishop Malone and the, and the crisis, do you have any idea what kind of impact it had on the collections on Sunday? Are parishes losing money on a yeah. basis, which perhaps led yeah. to Yeah. I've already heard of that, too. And, you know, in my experience, um, people are very generous. And they will give generously and sacrificially to what they believe in and what they believe is good. But they also want to know that what they believe they're giving to is going to where they intend it to be. So this is one of the challenges that I will personally have, and I'll take on it very regularly, to address that, you know, where there has been. You know, sometimes the withholding of finances is, is it also another way of stating I'm dissatisfied with the way things are. It may not even be a concern about where the money is going, but it may simply be that I'm angry because I'm not being listened to or because something is, some situation is persisting that is wrong. So I have to get to the bottom of that. Do you have a sense of how much money the diocese Not at this point, but I'm, I'm sure I will pretty soon as I'm briefed. And I'd like to follow up lastly. Um, you said you haven't talked to Bishop Malone? Oh, I've spoken with Bishop Malone, but not about uh, the circumstances in the diocese prior to his resignation. Can you sort of give us a timeline of when you were actually uh, appointed? Yeah, I, I was aware. Well, I, first of all, I was aware of the timeline of the report, you know, which was throughout the month of October that the visitation that Bishop DiMarzio was doing under the direction of the Holy See. And uh, I will tell you that um, at, at some point prior to my leaving for the Ad Limina, I received a call from the Apostolic Nuncio, Bishop Pierre, Christophe Pierre, that uh, I was being considered as uh, a possible appointee uh, as, as Apostolic Administrator, and that uh, he would take that to the Holy Father, this recommendation, and that uh, probably an announcement would be made uh, at some point shortly after the Ad Limina visit. Uh, so in Thanksgiving week, uh, I was made aware that it would happen, that Bishop uh, uh, Malone would uh, retire, and that uh, an announcement would be made. Uh, originally, that was scheduled to be December the 2nd, and I guess because of some circumstances logistically in the diocese, and I'm glad it turned out that way because we were snowed in in, 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 in Albany on Monday, that it would be today. So that was the timeline. No, I, I have no knowledge of. I have no knowledge of when, if uh, Bishop, uh, uh, whatever conversation Bishop Malone may have had with uh, with the nuncio or not. You know, I just know what happened in terms of my own uh, uh, information. That's all. Yeah. Bishop, this is Eileen Buckley from Channel Seven WKBW. Hi, Eileen. Oh, absolutely. And, and I encourage any survivor that uh, has come forward already or wants to come forward now to please come forward. And, you know, if you have a claim, if you have an immediate thing you want to report, do just as I said. And I will meet with any and all survivors. Uh, that's absolute. Yeah. How do you 
I think it's really a decision that every survivor has to make according to their best advice as to what is in their best interests, you know. And I would encourage any survivor to pursue whatever means possible in order that they may have their say, you know, whether they choose a civil means of doing it through the CVA. Uh, as you know, it's, we have a separate process, you know, through canon law in which a person can make an allegation, even a criminal allegation, uh, through uh, our canonical processes. And there's no reason why both cannot be done simultaneously. Remember that the CVA primarily uh, focuses on civil cases, so the standard of proof is somewhat different, you know. But if somebody uh, it wants to make a civil case in a civil court, which is fine, they may also want to pursue uh, it on criminal grounds, you know, if it was sexual abuse that was done, that is not available to them in civil law because of the criminal statute of limitations. However, the church does have a process whereby that can be pursued, and particularly if the, uh, if the, uh, uh, if the alleged uh, perpetrator is alive to be disciplined appropriately. Absolutely. I mean, any any way in which I possibly can. Uh, but also, you know, uh, one of the ways in which we can do this in parishes is by enabling parish leadership to engage people, particularly those who are the helping professions, to work together to create, as I say, this kind of oasis or context in which people who want to speak about, I, like I've known, for example, in my own diocese, one case, for example, in which a priest who himself had suffered abuse, you know, made that known to, to the parishioners. And interestingly enough, people started coming forward, and, and not because of sexual abuse by clergy, but by other forms of violence that they may have experienced in marriages and family life, and, and uh, actually started creating little networks where conversations could go on and, uh, and uh, a safe environment in a safe sort of way. So encouraging those kind of things in parishes to the extent that my presence would help. Uh, sometimes it is helpful, sometimes it's not. There are some times in which a person who has been a victim of abuse, say by a priest, may not necessarily welcome the presence of anybody with a Roman collar on. You know, so you have to be sensitive to what the needs of the survivor is in each case. And as I say, you know, we have to take this personal approach and, uh, and, and uh, uh, address every person with respect uh, from their own perspective and experience and whatever we can do to provide the support to do that, but not, not to leave anybody alone. Okay. Hi, Connie. Hi. Hi. That's right. So when you look at the future of this diocese, the fact that the pews are not filled, you're talking about creating an oasis of security and restoring trust, but how do you do that? It has to be done personally. That's the only way to do that. Come and see. You know, and one of the things that we believe, and it's not just Catholic Christians that believe that, but all disciples of Christ, that each of us has a mission to other people. And uh, I, I, I am very conscious that the institution has a responsibility to support that as well, too. But I think, for example, the question of why pews are empty, you know, uh, I, I find that speaking with a lot of young people, and I'll use the word millennials for want of a better word, you know, I, how many times have we heard people say, I'm, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious? You know, the fact that they're not sitting in the pew does not mean that they do not want a relationship with God. And a lot of young people I speak with just feel that they're not finding that sense of God's presence in the church community for different reasons, which we can talk about another time. They don't feel, they're looking for that transcendent, that God is here, and they're not necessarily feeling, or they're not feeling a sense of welcome or community, that somehow or other that they don't feel that. So making churches places of welcome, but also places where people feel they can really experience the presence of God. Uh, you know, that is the ultimate challenge. Uh, I don't know how, you know, Gandhi once said that if, if God was to come again, he'd have to come in the form of bread. I don't know if he was referencing the Christian belief in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, but he had that sense that, as you have pointed out, that there has to be a very concrete sense of personal presence. So I believe that that's the way it has to happen. 
And I don't, as you say, uh, issuing fatwas or statements or pastoral letters and all that. I don't know if anybody even reads them. You know, uh, I, I have to try to work, and we have to try to work very, very closely with people right on the scene. How can we welcome people back to say, this is a place where it's safe. You can encounter the presence of, we can pray together, we can talk together, we can walk together, we can share our stories, we can commiserate, uh, we can complain, we can express our anger, you know, but we don't have to be alone and we don't have to just do it on the, the screen, face to face. And one other question regarding Bishop Malone, when did you speak with him? I, I spoke with Bishop Malone on the bus in Rome one day and I was aware at that time, I guess, that he knew something was happening. I mean, this is, I, I, I don't want to sound mysterious, but, but you know, uh, the only communications I had was with the nuncio. You know, to be alert, something may happen. I was not a part of the process, and he came to me in the back of the bus. We sat there and chatted. You can talk to him. He would confirm that. And, uh, you know, just spoke kind of from the heart. You know, a lot of people are hurting. I feel, t you know, and whatever I can do to help and so forth. I didn't ask him who else knows. I didn't ask him whether Bishop Gross knows or not. Apparently, I found out he didn't. You know, but, but I've never been the kind of person. I'm not an investigative reporter. You know, I'm a very obedient guy. And when somebody tells me this is your task, you know, uh, and I'm not a military background, but I, I kind of like respect the chain of command. You know, and uh, so that's really what I knew. And, and, and uh, I have, in recent days, I've spoken with him. I was aware of the fact that he was home, you know, in Boston uh, for Thanksgiving and, you know, happy Thanksgiving. I was aware that he was under the weather. And, you know, I said, by all means, you know, uh, take time to recuperate. And he told me, you know, various things about can I uh, put out a statement and so forth. You know, he kept me kind of abreast of things. But we have not had uh, intense <coughs> conversations. And I think to some extent that's maybe better because I rather kind of face the situation without any preloading from anybody, you know. And uh, yes, I have read things in the papers as well, too. But, you know, no word is the last word. So this is a new day now. When do We're, you plan on meeting with him face to face? Don't you think that? I'm I don't have any plans immediately to meet with him. At some point, he may be back in the day. But see, my job is not to meet with Bishop Malone. My job is to do my job now as your spiritual leader. Bishop, we have Jeff Preval, also from WGRT TV. Okay. Later, Bishop, just to clarify one of your uh, most recent statements there, uh, on the bus in Rome with Bishop Malone, you said that he knew that something was going on. Could you, could you clarify mm -hmm. that? Did he not at all. Not at all. No, Bishop Malone just came to, came to me, I guess, assuming that I knew something. Uh, I, did, I just let him talk, quite frankly. I did not ask him any questions. Just to clarify, I believe, you know, from previous statements so at the beginning of the press conference, I believe you may have said that you either are not going to be the permanent bishop here or don't want to be the permanent no, no. bishop here. No, no. It has nothing to do with me. This is an assignment. I re I'm sorry, I don't mean to sound angry. Uh, I received this assignment from the Holy See. The assignment is apostolic administrator. An apostolic administrator is a temporary figure by definition. I am told that I am to be here as diocesan pastoral administrative person until the next bishop is appointed. I have no idea when the next bishop will be appointed. I don't know who the next bishop will be. Uh, I, I have no... It is entirely up to the Holy See who the Holy Father appoints as the next bishop. As simple as that. If, if I, I don't know what more I can say. Just like, also, since you're still going to be in Albany, or serving Albany. I have to, yeah. How do you plan on balancing, splitting your time? I don't know. I'm doing the best I can. I am one person. I, I've said I, I will. I am responsible as the Bishop of Albany. I'm responsible as administrator of the Diocese of Buffalo. Basically, the way I manage things is I work, as I said, through the Dracarian principle, accomplishing management through others, consultative management. I will make sure that people are in place, if they're not already in place, that can make sure that the ordinary business of the diocese goes on and, and is administered well. And that may mean making certain appointments that are not yet made. And I would also try as best as possible to be personally present. My, uh, Logistically speaking, my ability to do both uh, does not allow me more than, generally speaking, one full day a week in the Diocese of, the, 
of, uh, of Buffalo. And that is the general pattern that is followed by administrators that are appointed similarly situated. So that's it. I will give more time as is possible. Certainly uh, the time that I give is not limited to my actually physically being present in a chair. And to be honest with you, I'm not an office person. I don't spend a lot of time sitting in my office chairs. My people back home will, will guarantee. Uh, I like to be out and among the people. So as much opportunity as I ha can to meet with people, to meet with you folks, you know, anytime, uh, to have a conversation like this, uh, I'm very happy to do that. One final question. Um, of course, you all know we live in a digital age. And I noticed, I know part of a lot of us have noticed that you have a Twitter, yeah. Twitter account. We'll use it. Updates, sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Everything. I have very good communications people and we'll make sure that as much information as I have, as much information as you seek, that we'll use all of these medias of communication that we possibly can. Absolutely. Bishop, we have a follow-up question from Charlie Higgs. Yes, Charlie. Hi. 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 Yeah. Um, you know, so many of the survivors of sexual abuse, they say that it's not so much money or anything. That That's seeking, correct. They really want answers uh, that would provide them some sort of closure. I had a, a survivor who came to my office and he said, you know, all I want to know is uh, how many other you know, people this person abused and what years and when did they know it and the diocese won't provide me with that. So I was able to piece together for him with your record, you know, what actually happened. Thank you. Thank so you. Is that something would you release the secret files of at least the acknowledged pedophiles? Anything that I possibly can do to help victims in order to have the information they need, I will do. And if it means clarifying our list, you know, putting names up, putting more information, whatever can be done in a way that's transparent and responsible, absolutely. So even the specific personnel files of the acknowledged pedophiles? Personnel files, uh, you know, we have, I have to follow the, uh, Whatever it can be done within the scope of canon law is basically what I would say. And one last question of Bishop Ed is from Marley Tuscan. She is with Channel 4. Okay, Marley. Hi. I just wanted to ask, how do you believe that your path uh, serving on the Diocesan Review Board for Sexual Abuse of Minors will better help you serve? Oh, thanks for that question. I have to tell you the experience, and it's to what Charlie just said uh, a moment ago, too. When I was asked to be the priest representative of the priest on the Diocesan Review Board of the Diocese of Brooklyn in 2002, <coughs> shortly after the charter, I mean, I have to be honest with you, at that time, I thought this was a press-generated sort of thing, like a lot of people did something against the church and so forth, because I had no personal experience, you know, of, of the plight of so many people that were abused. And uh, what happened was, is my experience on the board just opened my heart to see all of the different, and this is partly of how I've developed the view that I have of seeing every person individually as a personal story, not just survivors, not just pedophile priests or whatever, you know. That experience of working with collaboratively, mostly lay board, you know, we had a police chief on it, we had a, uh, a college professor, we had a, a survivor of sexual abuse who himself was, a, was an attorney, we had a religious sister, we had uh, so many really good people. And meeting, hearing the stories, you know, of survivors, and I think probably about 40 or 40 or 50 that we listened to, first of all, the one thing that was clear from the start is none of them had to do with money. I mean, in the sense of that was not the motivation. Most, I just understood, we want to be heard. We want somebody to listen, you know, to take, take my story seriously. This happened to me. Uh, and uh, so uh, we even had an investigator working with us who was a specialist in sex crimes, and she was not even of the Catholic faith. And uh, I say this with pride and with surprise when it happened. She actually decided to come into the Catholic faith because she was so uh, moved by this experience of the, of the people on the review board and what we learned from the survivors and what we learned from one another. And we went at it at times too, you know, like we had disagreements and, you know, and there were some times in which some member felt we weren't given enough attention to, to, the, to the priest who might have seemed to be innocent uh, or we given too much, not enough attention to the, the, the actual circumstance. We had one case in which, anecdotally, but it's true, in which it did turn out there was a financial issue, but it was the case of a father 
who was in his 60s and came forward to tell an account of his own abuse because his daughter was in dire straits financially that he thought he could help her out. So he was willing to put himself on the line. He had never told his family, you know. And uh, so, I mean, but that was the, the motivation was, again, was to help another human being. So that really shaped my view of the, uh, of the what I think most survivors, the situation most of them face, you know. Uh, that having been said, you know, maybe I shouldn't say this, but I will, you know, obviously there could, there could be mercenary interests in whenever litigation is involved, you know. Uh, one of the things that concerns me with the CVA, I'm very happy was enacted, but a very small number of victims uh, really have access to the use of the CVA because in order to find a legal firm that will represent you uh, to make it worthwhile for them, it's necessary that they have some tie-in with some agency that can provide financial review. I mean, 81 percent by the statistics of, of cases of sexual abuse occur in families, you know, by people that are known, fathers, mothers, and people don't sue their parents and uncles. You know, so I'm concerned about uh, the vast majority of victims who will never have their day in court because they can't get a lawyer to even take the case, you know, and that's why I think it is important that we as a church keep our doors open and say, look, it, even if you don't want to get involved in a civil case, which you're welcome to do if you want, please come to us so that we can address, you know, and we'll, we'll get all the resources we need in order to make sure that people can tell their story. We have to do that. Well, the, the role of the board was advisory to the bishop, okay? And our job was basically to receive, first of all, when the claim came in from the victim survivor, and then what we would do is we would submit this to an independent investigator, okay, who was an independent contractor, professionally qualified, and then the, uh, the investigator would make the report to the, to the board. And then we would try to analyze, you know, does this seem to hold together? Is this credible? Uh, you know, uh, do the facts seem to be consistent and so forth? And we used principles that were available, generally speaking, in evidence, you know, because we had legal scholarship and I guess my own expertise there also helped me. And then we would make a conclusion. I would say maybe with one or two exceptions, about 99% of the time we found the allegations to be credible because usually people don't come forward unless it takes an incredible amount of courage to do this you know and uh, and then we would make a, a, the recommendation to the bishop and then the bishop I think almost invariably accepted the recommendation took the appropriate action uh, reached out to the victim to see what type of assistance could be offered which started actually right from the time the complaint was made you know, we would always do that, and we do that in Albany too. And then, uh, you know, appropriately, obviously, discipline the uh, the perpetrator as as is necessary. And it was a, a emotionally, spiritually, humanly a very enriching experience for me in my life. And I have to say, it has a great deal to do with my perspective right now. Thank you.